just, I, I tell people in downtown Main Street, I said the happiest people go to Hope Chapel. So prove me right and just look over at somebody and smile at them. Just smile. Prove my point. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Make sure you have your bulletin. We're encouraging people to get into a life group. Please write those things down that you feel God may have spoken to you about. So very, very important. Our series is Living Out Our Faith. We're going through the epistle of James, the book of James. And so if you have your Bible, it'd be great, or electronic version of the Bible. We're going to James. We really have a whopping two verses to cover, but we'll add some other ones as well. So before I announce this message today, I just want to highlight a couple of cute jokes. And actually, 12 grandchildren, I want them to feed me some jokes, so here we go. School teacher says, students, I want you to write sentences using the word bean. So one student writes the word, my father grows beans. Another young girl says, well, my mom cooks beans. And another student says, we're a part of all being human beings. Okay. Another one, cute one from the kids, but said, why was the number six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. Okay, there you go, huh? Think about that one. Today's message is entitled, Living Faith by Not Judging Others. Not Judging Others. So as we take a look here, James chapter 4, we're going to look at just verse 11 and 12. And Lord, we want to thank you. First of all, we want to just express to you, thank you for loving us. And I just say that to everyone listening to me. God loves you. God's committed to you. And if you were the only person on this planet, God would still come and give his life to give you life. So Lord, there's no judgment. Because perfect love casts out all fear and especially judgment. We embrace Jesus now and your word for us. We want to emulate you to society that's in need of rescuing in Jesus' name. Amen. How many have ever been on the receiving end of someone's critical, judgmental attitude? I'll keep both hands up. Okay, three. If you didn't raise your hand, that may be you threw a few salvos out. So, no, I'm just kidding. But how did that make you feel when somebody criticized you or critiqued you or maybe just did a character evaluation or judged you harshly about your motives or your intentions? And what was that like? What was your reaction? Wasn't it kind of like, hey, you don't know me. You don't know what I'm thinking. You didn't walk in my shoes. You can't describe what I'm like. You don't know my story. Don't you want to just tell, how could you do that to me? But it seems like that's a very common practice today in our society that people are criticizing and a common experience that we all have where people are saying things and doing things about others and harming their character. And so when you take a look, it seems like a favorite pastime of people and that you feel like very few individuals even have remorse when they start to judge harshly, criticize harshly other people. Just go on social media for five minutes, just five minutes, maybe on maybe a cable news, and you're going to see how people just criticize sternly other people. It's like, wow, what's going on? Maybe they are that bad. But we're going to take a look here. I feel as bad as that behavior is, we have to be cautious about that because we're finding that can creep into the church and probably worse yet, can creep inside of us, and we become critical. We become judgmental. And I feel that that's what our, the Bible passage is all about today, the timely element, especially in this voting cycle that we're in. Let's take a look at James chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. So it's speaking to Christians. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone, who gave the law, is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Wow. So let's take a look here. Some things, first of all, the element of judging, I define, and most would say is this. 
Judging another person is assuming God's role in assessing character, the motives, and the intentions of the heart. We are judging the unseen, and only God can see the real issue of the heart of people. Isn't that true? So when people judge character, and we see that there's some critical determination. Whenever we say that that person is evil, or that person's bad, or terrible, or they're a liar, or she's a witch, we're judging a person's character. And therefore, we want to take a look. There's a difference between character and behavior. So we want to watch out for that and deal with this according to the scriptures. So number one in your notes, go ahead and take a look at that. Our focus should be our own obedience, not judging others. Let's look at the scripture. Let's understand that what is our job as people who follow Jesus, letter A, judging others distracts us from our own obedience issues. So as long as I get a chance to focus on somebody else's faults and flaws, I don't have to look at mine. That's really what we're wanting to take a look at. It really says it here in verse 11, James 4, 11, but your job, what is my job? To obey the law, That's what the Bible says, not to judge whether it applies to you. Now, that's interesting when we consider something like this because we're looking here. I find when we criticize people, it helps me to ignore all of my glitches. I don't have time. I'm just focused on somebody else's bad character. So we have to watch out there. I can ignore my struggles, my inconsistencies, my hypocrisy, my sinful habits, and my lack of love for others. So it's going to be important when we take a look at this, when people come at, have you ever noticed when somebody comes after you like that, they're judging and they're criticizing you, family, relatives, friends? Don't you want to say, bro, Look at the mirror. You're you're describing yourself. But you can't say that, can we? But that's a perfect example how when somebody starts judging, we cannot see. Our job is, Scripture says, to obey the law. That's, That's our job, not to judge whether it applies to you or not. Let's go just a little bit further. Letter B, judging others makes us feel superior. Now, this is the essence of pride when we take a look at it. But verse 11 again, James 4, 11, says, If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. So just take a breath here for a moment. We, we love feeling morally superior. There's just something in human nature that says, I think I'm better than that person, or possibly I'm more righteous or more holy or more generous or more kind. And that person is definitely not, so I have every right to lay blame to that person. So we have to be careful. We think it's okay to do so. But when we do so, Scripture just says, we're criticizing and even judging God. Like, hey, I know God just said, we just read it, don't judge. We're saying, that's not a good judge law. That's not good. It doesn't apply to me. So now we are criticizing God. Did God really say that? I don't think that's important for me. That's what the scripture is talking about here. But it's very interesting. Once we demonize somebody, we actually feel it's okay, license, it's, I feel it's righteous to describe that person as just bad, evil, and we have to be very careful about that. And when we share in that judgment about what we think of that person, we pass it on. Now, that's what's called gossip. Everybody knows what gossip is. Now, we have to be careful in this political arena how hostile the environment gets because we could just hear gossip about somebody or someone. Well, do you know that person? Have you sat down and did an interview with it? No, I'm just watching this particular channel. Wow. I think if you sit down with anybody, you'd get a chance and say, wow, there's a reason why that person is that way. And my heart feels a little bit softer toward them. 
So therefore, there's something that's called character assassination. Sometimes we've seen that in past preliminaries through a Supreme Court justice being nominated and vetted. And man, they better not have anything in their closet. And if there is nothing, they'll still find something. And it's terrible. And we don't do our own research. And we just say, yeah, that dude or that woman, she's evil. How do you know that? Well, I heard. And we pass it on. So we have to be very careful about that. Judging others makes us feel superior. But we're also saying when we do this, we have been calling God's law to say not do that. Of, it's inconsequential. It doesn't apply to me. I'm good. Be careful. I can justify my judgment attitude, and literally my sinful attitude is actually righteous. I, I'm doing right by saying that dude's evil bad. She's wrong. Be careful. Watch out for that. So we begin to play God. And when we play God, letter C says, judging others assumes God's role. I I don't want to be in God's role, but we sure think it's okay to do that. But let's see what verse 12 says. James 4.12, God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. God alone. Now, there's only one judge, Scripture says. And guess what? You're not it. One judge. Therefore, I don't, you shouldn't, we shouldn't assume that role. I think we're getting ourselves into real trouble. We're too limited in our understanding. We're too biased in our own opinions. We don't see the intentions of the heart. We're fallen in our humanity. We just can't evaluate clearly. We really can't. I would like to. I trust other people's opinions to read certain things. But even then, they're fallen. So we have to be very gracious about that. Watch out. You've got to be careful. Have you ever prearranged accusation against somebody? You you don't tell them that, but just say, man, that dude, I have done that twice. To two ministers, I repented of, and Ainsley knows, like, honey, I'm wrong again. Because you sometimes see people's actions, like, that person just thinks he's, like, stuck up, Mr. Professional, Mr. Who does that person think? He doesn't talk to anybody. He's not out there in the public. There's something wrong with that guy. And then you sit down, and I had brunch with one of them, and I thought, what's wrong with me? This person has had a very bad life, and he's somewhat shell-shocked about humanity because they've taken them to task. And I said, I am sure, I didn't tell them that. I wouldn't tell, but it's like, what is wrong with me? So if you've not done that before and you might have kind of slipped into those, be careful about that. What did Jesus teach about judging? That's, he's our beautiful gold standard, isn't it? And what I could say, well, I've never murdered anybody, all I realized, man, the Beatitudes nailed me right between the peepers. Like, I've got to get a better grip on my attitude and actions. So, number two, God will judge us by how we judge others. What? Everybody ought to just say, man, danger here. What is going on? Letter A, when we judge others, we will be judged by others. And I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 7. Let's check it out. If you've got that red-letter version, you're going to realize it's Jesus speaking here. Verse 1, do not judge others, and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. It's that old, man, you sow something, you're going to reap it another time. You do something one season of your life, guess what? Watch out, it's going to come back to you. And that's really what it's saying here. Jesus says, how do you want to be treated? Because the way you treat others, guess what? It's coming. It's coming. It's like that golden rule. Anybody ever hear that? Were you Boy Scouts or Royal Rangers, Matthew 7, 12? Whatever you want people to do to you, do ye even so to them. That's the old King James Version. But, But it's important that we get a chance. If, in fact, you feel people have been judging you, criticizing you a lot. 
You've been on the receiving end quite a bit. You might want to evaluate and say, how have I been treating people first? What has been your attitude over everything? And especially men in our homes, we can set the standard in our home if we become irate and just dogmatic in how we, I mean, you could raise up a whole generation of critics. Be careful. Let her be. God allows us to set the standard how we will be judged. So again, Matthew 7, 12 literally says, the standard you use, there it is. Standard I use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. So when I see something like that, it's like, whoa, let's see what's going on. Because I start pumping the brakes. I'm going to not just do something. If this is the standard, I want a lot of grace. (laughs) I want a lot of mercy because I know I'm going to need it. I want to be able to help somebody. So... That's where we to take a look at what's your standard when you evaluate people you have never sat down with? What is it? Do you kind of just kind of write them off before you even get a chance to even invite them for a cup of coffee? Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Now, I've got a whole teaching on the eternal judgments, and basically, if you don't want to show up at the great white throne judgment, that's just how much hell a person will get. But then there's something for the Christians called the Bema Seat of Christ. This is part of that, the judgment seat. And that's not a mean thing. It's just like, hey, if you, if you like laid your life out for Jesus, even a cup of cold water for one of the little ones, the least, you will no wise lose your reward. Jesus said that. So when's that going to happen? Right here, right here. You're going to come before Jesus and say, I I didn't think anybody saw me do that. I saw you do that. When did it happen? On earth. So let's receive now what you've done. I think most of it's going to be just a lack of rewards. Would you like to see a lot of people receive accolades and be like elevated in that, you know, over 10 cities kind of a thing? I And then we're just barely in heaven because of what Jesus has done. That's no way to kind of thank the Lord. Like, hey, I'm here. I'm just glad to be the doormat in heaven. Well, you might. (laughs) I don't want to be a doormat. I'd like to be like at least the door opener. So it's going to be important we get a chance. God allows us to set the standard how we'll be evaluated. Number three, let's take a look at that. We must replace judgment with forgiveness. I like that. You know me. It's like, Lord... If you say we should remove that, what do we replace in that? I need a replacement. And part of that, letter A, forgiveness is our replacement for judgment. I like Luke chapter 6, verse 37. And it says this, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. That's But Jesus said, so instead of being judgmental and critical, be forgiving. Now, forgiveness is just flat tough. The deeper the wound, the more difficult to forgive. And the more difficult to forgive, we would probably want judgment as the reward for that person. But for you and me, the great healing element is to forgive. When we're hurt by somebody, forgiving them just seems so unfair. They should really pay. I, that's going to be between God and you, and it's going to be important. But without forgiveness, our hearts become filled with bitterness, judgment, and criticism. It happens. Your heart, my heart, only has a capacity for so much. And if we save that reserve to be critical and unforgiving, I find some good, well-meaning people have some of the most mean-spirited element because they haven't been able to forgive. Do watch out for that since our hearts are that way. So if you find yourself battling a judgmental, critical spirit, you might want to begin to ask the Lord, maybe today, maybe today, Lord Jesus, 
who do I need to forgive? Because I am just so ticked off at society in general. So you can see where just kind of somewhere along the line, somebody did something to you, and you are not allowing that forgiveness to flow. Has Jesus forgiven us? Oh, yeah. Can you forgive others? Don't let what somebody's done affect your, they're not even in your airspace, but look at how what they have done has now destroyed your whole involvement with society in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name? Jesus' name. So we take a look, letter B, forgiveness is an action that returns to us. I love that. I want to be forgiven. I know I'll need to be forgiven. Maybe, hopefully not just today, but... But it is interesting in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, it says this, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. So I need forgiveness extended to me. Anybody else out there? I find sometimes people who have not even asked our Heavenly Father, to forgive. And because of the cross, he's faithful and just to forgive. First John 1 John 1.9, he's faithful. I like hanging around faithful people. God's faithful. So if you've done something, ask God, forgive me, Lord. You make sure you forgive others, that, and you'll come across people that just do you wrong. Maybe because you're faith in the Lord. But the idea is going to be that you need to be a quick forgiver. You know me. I have shared there are two pillars, great pillars, that mark a Christian's life. Here they are. Here they are. The first pillar, they are forgivers. And the other one is they are givers. Those are two great marks. You put those two together, and you've got an awesome Christian going on. So when we take a look here, it's going to be important Who doesn't need more forgiveness? Let's look at number four. To not judge is not turning a blind eye to wrong behavior. And this is probably the one that's probably going to be the most freeing because in this, we always want to pursue restoration of people. That's the way the heart of Jesus is. He wants to restore people. And so I'm picking 1 Corinthians 5 and 2 Corinthians 5 show a little story here. We have letter A, we can judge sinful behavior within the church. Now, we're talking behavior. We're talking behavior, not character. We don't go after people's character. But we have a right to say what you're doing is, the Bible says to us, is wrong. In this setting here, 1 Corinthians 5, it's a setting where this guy is having wrong sexual relationships with his stepmother, and the Apostle Paul steps in and says, listen, this kind of action is not even going on with pagans. Address this, and if he doesn't stop it, get him out of the church. And when you kicked people out of the church back then in the first century, first century Christianity, there was no other church to go to. You were on your way. Now you kick the dude out of the church. Guess what? He goes down to the next church, and they make him a deacon. Huh? So it's going to be important that we get a chance to recognize this because the Apostle Paul says people that are into certain patterns, you got to be careful. Can we just stop the fans real quick? That'd be great. you got to be careful. There's just certain patterns that will affect people, and you are not to even associate or eat with them, and he lists that. But check it out here with me, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 5. He said, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. Now, isn't that interesting? So we can actually judge behavior as body of Christ, but not character. Don't eliminate a person because of that. only God sees the heart when that happened, when it took place, or what they're into. So don't go after the person's character, just the wrong behavior. So we can always agree with God because we could say, man, what you're doing 
Bible says that's wrong. You need to stop that. It's just like every good parent out there. Every parent should go up to their child and says, son, I, you are a good boy, but what you are doing by way of your attitude is wrong. That's how you approach a child. Daughter, you're a wonderful daughter. Good girl. But what you are enabling to do right here, the Bible says, is wrong. Stop. You never want to say you're a bad boy. Everything about you is bad. See, there's a difference. That's why it's important as a church, we want to rescue people and say, man, God loves you. But according to Scripture, what we understand you have allowed as a pattern of behavior, that's wrong. Don't do that. So we have a reasonable responsibility to lovingly hold each of us to the word of God. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, all three of you are with me on that. I, <laughs> right? Letter B. We confront sinful behavior with restoration as our motive. Man, that's just in the heart of Jesus. We're talking within the church, the Church at Corinth does what the apostles say, man, don't let this leaven just wreck havoc by saying it's okay to just have sexual relationships with your family members. Stop that. But then he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8, he says, I'm not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble hurt all of you more than it hurt me. Most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive and to comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. I love that, don't you? Look right there in verse 7. Now it's time to forgive him and comfort him. I love that aspect in Christianity. Let's restore that person. Let's address the conduct that they're doing. That's wrong according to scriptures. We have a right to do that. But let's go at it to restoration and bring them back. I like verse 10. He goes on. The Apostle Paul says, when you forgive him, I forgive him too. In verse 11, he says, you got to bring him back because we are very mindful of Satan's schemes. Now, think about that one. There's a lot that happens when we mishandle or misplace grace or proper leadership. If you might say, well, I, I would never kind of tell somebody they're doing wrong. Well, got to be careful because works of darkness will sweep right on in there. So I just want to pass that along. I think it's going to be important. There is no judgment here. There's no treating this person like a second-class citizen. They come into the church. We don't hold them at arm's distance. Like, man, we're glad you're here. Just by you being here shows there's a heart for God. We know that. We've all been completely restored through Jesus. Hallelujah. Ooh, I love that. I love that. Somebody knocked on your door and said, man, it's time to come back to Jesus what you're doing is sweeping you away, and you've been on a wilderness journey for 40 years. Come on back. It's so much better that way when that happens. So when we take a look here in Matthew chapter 7, be my last verse for today. In Matthew 7, 15, Jesus says this, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. Now, why would I bring something up like that? There are times that we have to just talk to you. It's nice when you have a community church like Hope Chapel. We get a chance to know each other. You might even see me and hang out and come to some of our socials, get to meet my best part of me, my wife Ainsley. She covers a lot of flaws. Don't Have you found that out? But don't you want to find out who each of us really are? To have a platform ministry and never really know the speaker, never really know the individual. And sometimes we have dear young ladies say, I just, you know, I know this guy's not really like living for God, but I'm going to nurse him back to health. Really? 
Well, what's their life like? What's their character like? Well, that's, that's judging, Pastor Paul. Well, it says we could just kind of identify them by their conduct. Wouldn't that be nice? So you want to be able to really just say, well, Jesus says you have license to really just evaluate. I want you to ask them and see what they're like and see what's going on. That's the beautiful thing. God says he remembers, I think, our sins no more when we ask him to forgive us. It's so important here at Hope Chapel and so important to Ainsley and me. We've all come through these doors and have experienced some of us many, many years and to see how gracious God has been to put us together. And if you're thinking that I cannot be fully immersed in the life and the love of Hope Chapel, I want you to know you can. No one's ever going to bring up your past. You know, if God can and he does forgive us, and then the Bible says he doesn't remember our sins, he casts them away. Micah says, as far as the east is from the west, puts them out in the ocean. Why would we want to go get scuba suits and go dig them up? I don't get it. So you're not going to be shunned here at Hope Chapel. I think there's no judgment here. Your past does not define you, but your identity with Jesus does. Amen, everybody? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your goodness. And Lord, how wonderful you have been which caused us to turn our hearts toward you originally to say, boy, I need a savior. So Lord, because of that, thank you for rescuing each one of us. And if there are those who are here right now and they feel like their life is distant from God and there's even just such a critical nature over them because people have spoke blasphemous things over them and they think that they are not a life worth really saving. We come against those lies in the name of Jesus. And Lord, thank you for allowing us to let us come just the way we are, but you love us enough not to keep us where we are. So Lord, bring healing and deliver us from the mindset of others who have labeled us one thing or another. Lord, don't let us follow in those patterns and tear up somebody else's life. Heal us, Lord. Heal us. And if you're here right now and you've never given your life to Jesus or you have given your life to the Lord, but you've been on a distant journey, God's revealed some things to you. Wouldn't it be great? Let's give our lives to him fully. Let's give our lives to him right in those areas that you haven't fully surrendered yet. Little Jesus here, little world there. Let's give him fully our lives to the Lord. How many say, I need to give my life fully to the Lord? Just raise your hand with your eyes still closed. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. I think I good. Let's, let's pray right now. Let's just pray all together. Just make your seat that little touch point, that altar point between you and heaven. This prayer goes like this. Dear Jesus, you know me fully. And I thank you, Almighty God, for loving me so much that you give me multiple chances. And I ask you now, dear Lord, forgive me for the way I've treated others. I want to ask you now, Lord, come into my life. Help me. I want to live for you. I want to actually help others. And I turn my life over to you. Be my Savior and Lord. Help me to risk for you and to be out serving others. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. I want to thank you for joining us today at Hope Chapel Huntington Beach. It's our desire to bring the teachings of this church to others globally. If today's message has brought you closer to Jesus, we want to know. Can you send us an email to office at hopechapelhb.org? Would you consider supporting this ministry financially? You can give securely online at hopechapelhb.org give. If a check is your preferred method, 
you can send a mailed check to Hope Chapel, P.O. Box 548, Huntington Beach, California, 92648. If you want to be contacted by Hope Chapel, would you consider subscribing to our weekly newsletters at hopechapelhb.org slash subscribe. Whatever season of life you're in, we want to go through it with you. We want to thank you once again for joining us, and God bless you.